Real Life Street Stars, man. Y'all put it together. Man, we got him in the building. Uh, his life should be a Netflix show or a more than a Lifetime movie. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing when we have these conversations where stories in Dallas for Wharf that we sometimes don't know have happened and we kind of be able to unfold on this couch. But we have Tegan Broadwater in the building, uh, uh, former, um, I want to say uh, former police uh, for Fort Worth, correct? Yeah. And let, no, let's just do it like this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read exactly when you Google Tegan Broadwater for everyone's at home wondering who this guy is. It says this. It says Tegan Broadwater is a CEO, musician, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and author of Life in the Fishbowl, the harrowing story, the harrowing true story of one cop who took down 51 of the nation's most notorious Crips in his cultural awakening amidst a poor gang-infested neighborhood. Is that an accurate uh, description that Google put, put, put on you? I, th- I would say so, yeah. I mean, that's, uh, you know, I try, to, I try to be a renaissance, you know? There you go, there you but, go. <laughs> you no, know, but a lot of it's based out of that, you know, kind of born of the story that, that started at the, with the book, you know? All right, all right. Well, we want to definitely get right into it. We want to jump right into it. Um, uh, in this interview, man, we're going to try to unpack a lot because, again, uh, like we were talking, uh, you know, we want to learn the psychology of, you know, what makes a man go deep on the cover. People watch movies like In Too Deep. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, what is it uh, with um, what is it with Leonardo DiCaprio? The Departed. The Departed. The Departed. Running, running Scared. Running Scared. And where Officer. Running, running Scared was a great movie, man. Uh, R.I.P. Paul Walker. There you go. Um, where an officer will go into a situation where he's going to go on the cover but not know the extent of what this undercover will be. There's no way to know the outcome. You kind of have an idea of what is what you want. For sure. And, um, you know, we're going to uh, kind of unpack that story. But first and foremost, uh, before we get started, the reason why we even got introduced to you, I got to, uh, of course, shout out uh, Charleston White. Um, he reached out, said, hey, um, I got a, you know, a brother of mine, you know, on the, that used to be on the force who, uh, you know, has a story out of Fort Worth that doesn't get told a lot. There's a book about it. But you, and he asked me, do I know the story? I said, no. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm that born and raised Dallas, and I don't know the story. That's so we fun. said, man, it will be amazing if you guys get this guy, man, Tegan Broadwater. You know, we talked to him on Anton Daniels, and he's been on your podcast, mm-hmm. uh, which is called the T. Um, uh, Uncommon Souls T-Cast. T-Cast. The T-Cast. Uncommon Souls. Yeah. Um, and I said, definitely, it's a story we want to tell. But first and foremost, how did you even get introduced to a guy like Charleston White? Because he's he was the guy who, in Fort Worth, was, you know, one of the guys that you would think you would be trying to put away. Right. He's and then all of a sudden, yeah, up. you're sitting down with him. Yeah. yeah. How does that introduction even happen with y'all two? It's funny. So uh, I had an old college buddy who was tracking my podcast and said, hey, man, I've been catching some little uh, clips of this cat, and you need to go check him out because he sounds like a lot of his ideas align with some of the, the guests that you have and the and the the lessons that you're trying to promote. And, and so I went and I said, okay, well, I'll go check them out. He sent me some clips. I started watching a little bit. And then out of nowhere, I, don't, I wish I could remember which one it was. I remember he's dressed like an old farmer or something. <laughs> yeah. But he called my name out at one point as I was just flipping through. And I showed my wife, he's like, uh, check this out. He's, he's saying, you know, I, I don't remember, shout out to Tegan or something like that. And I thought, well, now nah, I'm, that's that's just something that you got to like follow up on. So <laughs> that's why I reached out to him. I was like, do you want to chat or something? And we set up a, a meeting at a Starbucks. He was a little tentative about meeting a whole lot of people associated with the book indirectly or directly. And um, and we sat at Starbucks for three and a half hours. It's supposed to be 30 minutes. My wife's dinging my phone. Everything OK? Right, you know, right, but we right. had a fantastic conversation. I think we, we were really aligned on a lot of the ideas and stuff. And of course, I hadn't seen a lot of the extreme stuff but I know him as a person uh, and the way he thinks, you know, there's, there's a lot of really good things that he, that he stands for as well. So. And I think he said he knew some of the guys that were part of that uh, drug bus um, yeah. in regards to where, you know, uh, you know, in the, in the fishbowl. Mm-hmm. Now let's, let's do it like this. Um, you know, overall, you know, I added it up and you, you handed out your, your uh, undercover involvement in this case handed out 579 years. Did you ever know that amount, that number out of all of it? Uh, no, I mean, no, not really. I mean, that's a lot of years. It's a lot of years. A lot of years. Um, and 
Uh, it's a lot of families. We're going to go through there. There's a lot of uh, things torn apart. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, you know, for that to be something that was the outcome, I'm curious to even what was the income as far as what made you even want to uh, go at this, you know, area sure. of the fishbowl. Yeah. Uh, uh, what made you want to say, let me start the investigation because you were already a cop for, I'm assuming. Uh, at, at the time, uh what did I have? I had eight, uh, eight or nine years in at that time. Um, yeah, so this particular area of town is a little six square block area, one way in, one out. Um, I, I'd worked around there in patrol and everything else, which makes it, this story even more ironic because I was down there in uniform working as well. <laughs> but again, everybody looks at a, a cop differently when you're in uniform. They almost don't recognize you in street clothes. So, um, so the city was having a really hard time. There was a lot of innocent people that were trapped down in this hood that had been living there for generations. You know, there's some older people, there's some people that are trying to raise kids and the gangs have just taken over the streets out there and they were running quite a bit of game. Uh, it was a, a one large family of descendants that had come from a big uh, drug family. And so they had the blocks divided into two and they had a whole system set up. So. At one point, the city council had brought it up to the chief of police and said, spare no expense. We need to start doing something because, you know, for the sake of the people in the neighborhood who don't want violence around their kids or grandkids or whatever. Um, and they they tried all the, the standard tactics, you know, jump outs on unmarked vans or writing search warrants or just pulling people over that are coming and going and everything else to no avail. I mean, everything was a dry hole. And um, I would come to find out down the road that there was actually an informant cop working on the other side too. So the cop was able to feed information to those cats running their game that, you know, that somebody was coming or whatnot. So I didn't know that at the time or that had been even a bigger concern at the time. But, uh, and my wife uh, was even privy to, you know, a call that I went in on, on patrol, you know, where they had some kids there and there was some knife play on a domestic and, that we had to take the kids and take them across the street to somebody else. And the, and the kids were delightful, but the, the aunt was all put out that she had to take care of the kids now. And it was around Christmas time. They had no Christmas presents. We brought presents to them. I mean, it was just, there was a lot of, a lot of violence uh, and, and a lot of very interesting characters down there to start. Wait, so you said that in the fishbowl, they had a, a cop on the inside. <clears throat> yeah. To be able to know when bus are coming in. Yeah. Did how long do you think they had a cop on the inside? Oh, forever. Uh, uh I mean this is this dude was like coaching these dudes in peewee. <laughs> so so for a minute. But uh, I, I was completely unaware of that that aspect or or it would have been a different approach. So uh, I I usually describe the story as uh, you know, once I I thought, okay, you're trying all these standard tactics and I know you know, going deep undercover is, is such a faux pas and, you know, it's all in the movies. It's stuff they did in the 70s, all that kind of stuff. I'm like, man, this only makes sense. It's the only way to tackle this. And I had sat uh, over a, of a sip of whiskey with, a, with an informant and brought up my plan. I said, man, I'm going to go down. I'll, I'll pose as a dealer. Just got my sources busted by the feds. And, and I kept thinking, if, if it were really me and I, and I just decided, all right, I'm going to cross the line. I'm going to go and sell loads of coke where would i start and this is where i'd start anyway you know so um after he finished laughing for about five minutes straight i I said i said dude i'm i'm dead serious i mean i I really think that i could i could pull this off i mean you know just despite my indian tan you know i do stand out a little bit amongst the crips you know but uh my my plan was to go in as as a drug dealer um and so he said that's you know that's a that's a terrible idea. What time are we going? So at that point it was, uh, it was on and, and I just started rolling down there and, you know, leveraged that, that connection there. You know, I got obviously lots of skepticism and stuff, but I didn't mind no's and I knew the purpose behind what I was doing was noble because again, you're trying to salvage a neighborhood of people that are trying to do right. Um, that are being taken over by people that are doing wrong. And it's my job as it's, it's my job. And so it was a way to make a true impact on the neighborhood at the time. That was the, uh, that was the objective at the time. Now, 
I hear the nobility in your wanting to complete the task. Um, but what made you feel like you had it even in you to get that done? Like, what about you that made you say, I'm going to be able to infiltrate this organization? That's a great question. Um, Cause growing up as a kid, I, I grew up as a musician. I was a, I was actually a musician by profession until I was almost 30 years old. I didn't even do cop work until later. Right. Um, and in my experience, I grew up in Houston. I was playing clubs and stuff like that at the age of 14. And I was the only white dude within 20 miles. We're going in and practicing three days a week in the ward and I'm going down and, I, and I, I was inspired and befriended by a lot of folks that were outside of my typical culture. And, um, and then I left there and came up to North Texas to go study music at North Texas. And of course, there you've got all kinds of dope and different types of people that are interacting. And I just felt like I had the personality. So when I started police work, that was my goal in the beginning is I thought, man, undercover work suits me well. Um, everybody likes the idea of, you know, kicking in doors and running and gunning too, of course, but that wasn't really my personality because I'd hardly ever played with guns at all in my whole life. Cause I was a musician, you know, I came in a peace loving dude, but I get along with everybody. So that's why I thought I could. Now, um, usually, uh, when you're looking for a, a plug, or a dude who says he is a plug, you look for something discerning, like, uh, you know, face tack, uh, like ha drug habit, um, something. And I mean, I'm looking at you now. Obviously, I didn't know you back then, but you don't look, I don't see anything on you that would say, yep, plug. Right. Are you, like, what did you, ch if anything, what kind of changes did you have to make or what, what did you, how did you prepare to walk in it so you can look and fit the part? So this is, this is how I approached it. Um, I was a high-end cocaine dealer and had, uh, I leveraged an informant to be my guy that was just trying to up his game a little bit. And so I was helping him out. So we'd drive down on the blocks and he was buying small stuff. So when I start treading down there, I'm not even wanting to buy anything. I'm not even wanting to put my hands on anything. So all I'm doing is driving down. He's doing the talking. He, they obviously want to know who I am. So I just tell him, Hey, you know, I'm just in the game. I'm trying to help my partner out over here, whatever, you know, so take care of him. I'm not, I'm not worried about doing nothing. He would go do his deal. I'd hand him the money and it would look like I was kind of funding his, his game. Ultimately, what I would say is like, look, you know, this is all hard out here. I'm, I'm looking for soft anyway. So this isn't really, this isn't really my game. So obviously people that are really interested in making money are still interested in me if they think I'm the money guy. So aside from being robbed, which was the first concern, the second was, hey, we got to, they want to get into me. So uh, me saying no and holding off was the easy thing to do until such time I started saying, you know, look, let me take a few samples over. I'll drive it over to the university or something, see what I can do with it. You know, give you a, a, a buy a yard or something to see, you know, spend a hundred bucks and whatever. Of course, I'm working on a PD budget too. So buying samples was my, was my thing. I'm acting like I'm big, but I got 51s and like 720s, you know? <laughs> so I got a wad I'm pulling out, but I'm, you know, doing this number here. So they don't know that I've got basically, you know, stripper money. Yeah, pocket so, change. So. <laughs> But so that was the idea is that I, I didn't I didn't go down trying to purport myself as a gang member or a drug user. In fact, when they would ask stuff about, you know, using everything else, I was on probation and I don't mess with it. If you think that's a, a deal breaker. Cool. That's fine. I got other people I can do business with. That's that's why I say cops are always you know really eager to, to make a deal and make a case and then get it in, get it out, get it done. And my whole thing was this is going to be long term. And I got to make sure I have people that I'm targeting that are actually have that are part of the violence that's happening here. So it wasn't just a dope case either, because I wasn't naive. I know working dope is a giant wheel spin. I get it. Yeah. Of course, if you if you'd never worked dope, then it's going to get worse. But uh, I, I was realistic about that. But the whole objective, again, was to get into the gangs and Obviously, I'm not going to try to fit in or talk different. Where I mean, I had a little bit longer hair. You know, this is about all I can grow in about six weeks anyway. So, God. I had a baby face. 
and, but does that answer your question? Yeah, no, and, and that's what I was going to ask. Um, what was your appearance? What kind of car when you first got into, you know, trying to get in the game? What car yeah. were you driving? What type of clothes were you wearing? Uh, I wore basically baggy clothes. I mean, I was kind of a gym rat and stuff. I wore baggy clothes and a, and a ball cap. Honestly, if you, you know, when I think back on it, it screams cop, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, if you're a white dude, kind of, a, I just kind of, I wore, I would purposefully wear like a Steve Young jersey, you know, down to the pit. And, you know, this is crypt territory. So I would plead ignorance, you know, these guys are like, what the hell are you doing? You know, by the time I get to know, those guys are pulling me aside saying, dude, you can't, you're a fool, you blah, 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 and explaining me stuff, which to me is evidentiary. Uh, but again, it was just going out of my way to say, look, I'm not trying to fit in. I'm something else. I've got the funds to make this game happen. And, and it was just about the money and I was patient. So, so I'm just curious because, you know, again, you know, you're on a black pa platform. Uh, most of the people who I'm sure were part of your arrest were uh, young black men. Yep. And, you know, for you to even be, tell your story here, um, you know, it just says a lot. But I'm curious, um, you know, when you see something like that, as far as your goal is to infiltrate our culture uh, and put a stop to the crime that you see, your thoughts on how accepting are we of someone when they have money, whether what culture they are, white, black, Indian, Asian, uh, are, we accept, are we more acceptive when it's like, money's involved i don't think that is indicative of the black community i think it's indicative of any community that is lacking funds yes. and and uh the only reason honestly that i ended up targeting the crips in a black community is because that's where i was launched as a rookie so it's all i knew i knew who some of the players were i knew some of the issues that were happening around the neighborhood i was keenly aware of the neighborhood and its issues but it wasn't like i said hey, I'm not going to uh, pick on the white supremacists. You know, they need to be left alone. Because I'll be honest, they're way worse than any crip or blood or whatever because they base a lot of their actions on hate specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a different game. And I did do some work with them too. Obviously didn't blow up a big case. Uh, and I did some work uh, with the Mexican mafia too before I ended up leaving because by the time people knew what I was capable of at the end of this, at the end of this case... Um, there were too many people that were paying attention to it. too many gold badges involved was getting their finger screwing everything I was trying to do. And part of the reason I even succeeded was that I had a boss that let me take basically the whole team's budget out every week and spend it on samples wow. and try to work my way up and trust that I was taking care of myself, which is super rare again, because I mean, I, and I don't own a business. If I got somebody who's like, hey, I want to go do my own thing, I'm going to put myself in these dangerous situations. I mean, I don't want that liability. So I understand why that would be a real rarity and, and him looking out for me and knowing that I'm just a hard worker and knowing that I'm, I'm, I'm up to something that is uh, above board uh, is the only reason that it succeeded. So I'm curious, so did you ever arrest someone in that area that you later might have seen? So while, yeah, while, while undercover, and and this might be a racial thing, maybe not, but there was a dude that only after all the roundup had been, had been done that we found out that one time I had gotten a call from a, a parole officer and said, "Hey, can you do could do a pickup? He's going to show up for an appointment. He's got a warrant." And I just did a pickup, you know, and I show up and arrest this cat, and you know, years later, I'm, we're driving around and scoring and doing all He didn't recognize me either. <laughs> I didn't recognize him. He didn't yeah, recognize me. Recognize no, I had no <laughs> idea. I didn't know until the very end when we're, you know, pulling history records and stuff, you know, if I know you as, if I know you as Goose, that's, that's, I got to do an investigation and figure out who you are. It's not like we had great internet stuff and, and social media was massive. I mean, you're having to do some real digging to figure out who these people really are. I mean, half, the, half these guys don't really know the full names of some of these cats that are working around in the street, let alone me coming in as a newbie doing that. Do you feel bad at all for taking everybody down? Oh, absolutely. Um, so let me clarify. That's a great question uh, because what I feel is despair for it having to happen. I, I did my job. And what I started to realize by the end is that this is a necessary step, but it doesn't solve the problem. Um, and there were a number of people, I mean, we were 51 people altogether. A number of them, I was just like, man, this is gonna be, I'm gonna 
I'm going to testify as a character witness for this guy and he's going to get a low sentence and I'm going to help him out because this guy I can tell has got enough to get out and straighten his life. And, and I lost those battles because when I came out, there were people that, that either, it went one way or the other. They either looked at me and couldn't understand that I was sitting on the other side of the table with an FBI agent doing a debrief. And they were like, man, T, tell her, she's lying. You know, tell her, you, you know. Or they just give me the finger of like, dude, I thought you were somebody, now you're somebody else. But, and then there's me in, inside my mind saying, well, well dude, I, I know who you are and I know you have promise and I, and I will testify for you. And I actually did uh, testify on a few people's behalf and state that they had, you know, they had hope in life. I thought they had social redeeming value. And, and when they give me the finger and then they go do 17 years, it was, it was horrible. For, it was, I was, I was mortified. Um, it's not like you can take it back. Um, and it's not that they didn't commit the crimes to do the time. It was all still part of the game, but it was, uh, I mean, I was, really upset about a lot of it. I mean, and on the other hand, there was a lot of guys too that I think should never get out that are probably going to still get out that are doing nothing but, you know, carousing and, and bringing more people to their game and making it worse for everybody yet again, which contributes to the cycle. So I, I kind of compare it to um, when I started to get the, the bird's eye view of this at the end, I start comparing it to people that are in human, tra human trafficking. And they say, hey, you know, we want to hire you guys. Come on, we're going to do a team. We want to do an entry and rescue all these women from human trafficking. I was like, okay, then what? Because as you know, you go bust the house down, pull eight women out of there, and then just put them back in their homes. Then in three weeks, they're all going to be back at that house. So that's what we discovered ultimately with this as well, is that I, I really did, and it, it was... It was naive because look, I'd never done a federal case like this before. Um, let alone, you know, if I had 51 state cases, it would have been a, a giant deal. Uh, but I had worked with judges on a state level and I've gotten people breaks left and right. I put my reputation on the line for people and said, look, I, I will vouch for this person in order to give them proper breaks because I truly believe that they will get out and do something uh, that will redeem themselves. So. When I say I feel bad, it, it broke my heart to watch them go away. Um, and, and I just hoped that they would cooperate more. But again, that's just kind of my, my naivety because I assume they're going to cooperate and believe what I'm telling them after I spent a year and a half convincing them that I was someone else. And that's, that's a little bit naive. I just, you know, being with myself, I know that that's exactly what I would do. But I, I found that some of them wouldn't even sit down at the table to have that conversation. So... Yeah, it was. I had a I had a rough time dealing with it for some time. Well, well how many would you say out of fifty one people, um, who was actually trying to just provide for their family and who was just pure evil? Because mm. you know we 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 say some a lot of dudes' excuses be like you know this is the only way to provide you know this is this is where how this is the product of, we're a product of our environment yep. and then you just have the guys who like. No, nah, I just, I don't care about anything. I just want all this money. And I think that was, that was the, the crux of the problem mm -hmm. was that you had some gang leaders who were true gangsters that were leading these other folks. And, and so a lot of the middlemen were also violent. We, you know, by the time we rounded these people up, we solved nine cold case murders because mm -hmm. these dudes aren't just weed dealers. Right. You know what I mean? So, um, I don't know what that number would be, but I do concede that there were people when you work a conspiracy case, there were people that were claiming crip that were probably mid-level dealers or connectors or whatever, just trying to, uh, honestly, I don't, I don't remember very many family men. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, that's unfair of me to, to make a judgment call because look, if you're a kid, and your dad pays little attention to you, that's one thing. If you're a kid and your dad is never there, that's an entirely different thing. So I'm not making a judgment on that, yeah. but I, I did find um, even my mid-level guys would, would struggle to remember the middle name of their kid. They had three kids last year. He's trying to remember the middle names of one of them and everything else. I just, it was like, 
it was kind of depressing and they were just spitting out kids and then the kids would do whatever. Um, if I, I didn't get into it far enough to know, um, I knew the people as people, but I didn't know them as family men very often. So I think we were just at a level again of the gang is a gang not a drug operation. I think in a drug operation, you would probably find more of the people that you're talking about, uh, but the people that were leading them were truly dedicated crips. Yeah, I was gonna say, do you feel like you got the head of the snake? <clears throat> uh, I do in town, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, it was about a, you know, about a quarter million dollars of product a week uh, from, a, from a local kid is, saying pretty much uh, is that the, there's a guy by the name of x-man is that the is that the main guy uh as yeah. far as who was bringing that yeah and in? again he's he's smart he was smooth never touched it, it so, what kind so of car cool. was he driving was he like like i'm off the grid i'm just yep he drove a stock blue durango regular old wheels did have some tint but didn't draw any attention and so many of these other cats again you start getting some money and you're gonna Hell, that's what I did. I mean, you start making some money. You're like, oh, I'm going to get a better car. I'm going to fix it up, whatever. And that's what everybody does. But if you're doing something illicit and you're smart, then you're, you're playing a low-key game. So you got everybody else touching it. You got everybody else doing deliveries and making drops, the traps and all that stuff. So he was very smart about how he did it. We never did find that fool's money either. He's he out. Oh, he knows where it's at. He uh, well, it's fine. He's it's fine. fine. It's fine. It's all good, man. Like I said... I got what I got, and they got what they got, and if they get out and and wow. dig it out of the dirt somewhere, then more power to them, man. Good luck. Now, <clears throat> at, there is there comes to a point to where you're like, you're so invested, and you're seeing all this money, and this is more money than you've ever seen, and it's like this fool's counting a million dollars yeah. in a eighty thousand dollar house in the right. middle, yeah. Uh, in the in the living room, I mean, yeah, you're right. Uh, Never seen that before. Right, and and it's like, do you? And where's there ever a point you like? I can't stop this. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like this, whatever, whatever this, whatever I cut off right here, this <clears throat> somebody's gonna come and step right into this place and be this person. Of course. Um, again, if you look at it as a dope case, for sure. Um, I mean, I think the price of a key in the area, even in Dallas. You know, when I, at the time you, you buy a key for about 19, five, 20, 20 grand, something like that. And if you were buying in bulk, I was getting them for 16, 16 and a half. Um, but they went up almost to the price that you see a key for now, back then for a good six months, because nobody knew who was who anymore. And they were worried that there were more people on the list and somebody doing a quarter million bucks a week is responsible for a good amount of what's going around the whole metroplex you know at that point and he was doing transactions in dallas as well so um yes it is a kind of a wheel spin and i know uh you know people people were killed that followed suit and tried to step in and take that role because again if you're if you rule with violence and you're a legit crip and you're running your business like a crip then people don't just step in and take over. It's not how it works. I mean, you see that in the tying gangs and everything else the same way. It's not just anybody that can step in and run the business just because you're smart at the business. So there were people that died as a result of trying to pick up where they left off. Yeah. Is there something that you saw that you were like, oh, for sure I'm going through, through with this? For sure I'm not going through? Yeah, or? that I'm going through with this. Like, for instance, like a child something happening with a child that you like, nah, this has to stop. Uh, well, that, that experience in the, in the bowl that, that one time again was in patrol. Uh, but for the most, for the most part, honestly, when I, I did spend time going down and not buying, I'd go in and, you know, bring a few magnums and beat somebody at, at Madden and then, it it changes you know the the relationship right so when you so, say bring a few magnums I'm, yeah, there's multiple guns magnums. no 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 yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah i'm just messing with you yeah yeah <laughs> i'm just messing with you to bring some malt liquor of whatever <laughs> and you know share a few share a few brews or whatever and uh you know i beat your ass in madden now i got a little more cred i mean i still look like a white stiff nerd but 
No, at I least mean, I can play Madden. That might make me a little angry. Yeah, that might make me a little angry. You like, how good did you have to get in Madden? How bad? I would say, hey, at the time I had an 11 year old at home, so I was I was decent at the Man, time. So were you talking shit while you were like? No, <laughs> no, no. Look, you don't, uh, again, can't see me. No, I'm not a bear poker. I, I don't okay, need, like, okay. especially if you're staring at a screen in somebody else's house, and I was keenly aware of where I was. I don't need somebody coming up behind me and just spraying the TV with my guts. That's all right. Yeah, man, that'll be wild if the if the if the the bus of the century gets toward it because you got pissed at Madden and <laughs> then let, out, let the cat out the bag just for no. losing. Well, so, it was just a way to connect, you know, because it was something fun for me too. And, and that's, again, how I grew to really appreciate these guys. But again, there was, so to answer your question, actually, uh, now that I tell that story, I remember a specific example where we went into a particular house. I had an informant that had gotten his brains beat out because he owed this cat that I'd been working with a couple hundred bucks. So I went, took him, fixed him up and dragged him over to my guy's house and paid his debt. And while we're standing there, he's got long guns and uh, scales and bags of stuff laying all over the house. And he's got three little kids running around there rampant, five, six, seven, eight year old kids running around with all this stuff just laying out. And that's, to me, that's pathetic. Um, uh, and there's, there's no excuse, but I know, was, again, I, I can't be the judge of, Hey, you are a bad father. So you deserve to be away from this kid. Cause again, a kid having no father in some instances might be better, but I know it's not a great situation for a kid not to have a father, you know, but if you have a father like that, sometimes it might be, you might stand a better chance growing up at your auntie's or your grandma's house where they yeah. can teach you something else, you know, understandable. Um, so I have to ask, uh, in regards to going undercover, that means you have to allow crime to continue for, you know, the little drug deals. Uh, you know, like you said, somebody getting assaulted, uh, you know, selling, you know, let's say low, a small amount of Coke or, you know, crack or anything like that. Did it mess with you as far as allowing crimes that you know you would technically as a cop would bust somebody for it, seeing that? Um... It's, this is interesting because uh, when you read the book, you'll understand it better how I kind of manipulated that because obviously I'm not allowed to just show up and say, and because people were wanting to do business with me. By the time I'd been in there a year, it was just rolling around the blocks. People were coming up and stopping me and wanting to do business. Um, but I, I'm not selling to people that, you know, these are, these are the folks I'm leveraging to make cases on, but I'm not passing out crack. Um, so... Um, there was a couple different instances where I watched crimes happen. One was, uh, this dude was trying to do some kind of gibberish with me and said, man, this old lady's gone, blah, blah, I'm gonna go hit her house. And I'm thinking, was, man, he goes right up, kicks her door in, walks out with her TV. This is, we're talking about this 80 year old lady that lives on the top of a hill with a wheelchair ramp and everything else. I'm thinking, man, you fool. So I'm trying to call. Uh, uh, I'm trying to call like a patrolman, you know, when he takes off and goes, jumps out, I'm trying to call a patrolman, but you know, the cops in the area, other than my best friends have no clue what I'm doing out there. So, so for you to call up and say, Hey man, there's a, a, a burglary in process, progress. And I'm, I'm just sitting here watching it. And they're like, what, huh? I just yeah. look, just, just freaking get up to this address. I can try to explain later, but I ended up finally catching up to that dude, but I ended up having to buy that lady another TV because that, that's a sad situation. Um, but I actually had another dude, by the time I had established myself, um, I had cats that were protecting me because they, they're like, hey man, guys that look like you, you know, get two by fours across the head when they come out here and do this stuff. So I, I got you because I know you've been doing business, whatever, and I actually had protection out there. And I got to know this other dude that just got an inheritance come through and his inheritance, he was wanting to get, of course, take his money and go start buying keys. And you don't, as you know, too, in the game, you don't just like be a dude and then all of a sudden start trying to buy keys either without people think, uh, I don't think so, right? He's a little dude. And so what I did was I made a deal because he was from a different part of the neighborhood and knew a bunch of people. I said, well, I'm trying to get to know so-and-so because I would like to do some business with him. You make me some intros. And then when you do your business, you tell me what you're going to do. I'll call ahead and make sure you have protection. So essentially what would happen is this cat would say, Hey man, I'm going to go buy half a bird. 
uh, from so-and-so, I'd call so-and-so, hey, I'm sending this fool in. And then he would come in as if he's working for me. So these dudes are seeing birds leave the table thinking it's me. It's really this dude's own money. And he's able to go do business and grow his business, but I'm not actually witnessing. I'm just calling ahead. So it's kind of my, I would call it plausible deniability. <laughs> you know, it's not ideal, uh, but again, it's dope and we know dope's gonna move. And the ultimate goal is to salvage this neighborhood and, and try to get some of the gang violence removed. And like I said, it was just that piece of the puzzle. I'm not gonna pretend putting everyone in jail solved the problem, but that's why I'm sure we'll get to the other end of how we had to tackle that. Did you wear a wire? No, and that was part of the problem I had from the PD because uh, I worked off the books more than 70% of the time. I didn't even have cover. Um, and I, I, the only thing I would do is I would call, like if, I, if you and I had worked in patrol together, you know the hood, I would call you. You know I'm working a case, but you don't know what, but you just trust me because we've had each other's back before. I would call and say, hey man, this is where I'm gonna be. Here's the address, here's what I'm dealing with. If I say whatever, if I start saying honey, honey bee, then uh, drive the car through the front door and get my ass out of there. You know what I mean? And we would just connect on a cell phone line because at the time you gotta, this is back in oh five, six, seven when I was doing all this stuff. Um, all the wires, all the technology that the police department have was exactly like what you see in the movies. It's like, you need to take this microphone yeah. right here. They, man, you can fix it and get me killed. Yeah. And the other option was you, you do it according to standard, which is police protocol is you get your team together and you got six white dudes and un and non tinted <laughs> rental <laughs> enterprise cars and backwards hats like mine, you know, and you're like, man, this is, this just doesn't work like that. It's too difficult to do anything long-term without getting discovered. Did so. someone ever try to search you for a wire? No, uh, I wouldn't let people touch me. Uh, and honestly, if you don't want me to come in this, this room, if I always say, look, I'll, I'll pat you down first. And then you, know, you pat me down. They say, fuck you. I was well, fuck you too. <laughs> Uh, because I, the, I'm, look, we've been doing business. We can keep doing business or I cannot do business. If, you know, I have my protection and it is what it is. I don't, I don't have any concerns, but the same thing with dope. If they ask you, they, they want you to do dope. Then it's the same thing. It's like, no, I don't, I don't do dope. I'm not at that level. I'm not muling stuff around and trying to get my fix as a payment. So, so did you keep a gun on you at all? Yeah. Okay. I just carried a little five shot 380. It's nice right. and nice and tight. It wasn't, you know, an amazing tactical weapon, right. but it was something that I had. Um, and so, and again, I didn't, if someone said, do you, do you have a piece? I would say, yes. I mean, we've had moments where, you know, it'd say, what do you got? What do you got? And we'd talk about it. I'd rather sit in the front seat and somebody say, hey, man, it's got this new 44 and show me what it is. I'd rather know it's there, know what it is, know where you're keeping it. And, and I said, well, I just got this little, I, that's, that's all fine with me. I, I just, I don't need to be searched. And uh, so never, it never happened. It's... We see a lot of, uh, you know, in today's society, people like to show off their firepower. You know, we got 30 round clips, 50 rounds. Were you, did you see any type of weaponry, weaponry like that? Or like, and did you wonder like, how are y'all getting these, this, these guns like this? Yes, I did, and I knew exactly where they were getting them. <laughs> it's the corner of Barry and Miller. They get them all the time over there. Uh, so, um, yeah, absolutely. Legal when, weapons out the yin-yang for sure. When you see, like, like, like now the thing switches. Like, when you see an automatic weapon, like, in the hands of essentially a child, like, do you, like who? because it has to be someone with, well, you can make a switch, but, like, just like, a, like you say, like an AR-15, like, how did... You say out the court, but where is that coming from? Like, what is that about? Do you know? Where it's coming from? Oh, like, you mean the culture shift? No, like, like who, where do you, where do you get a, a dirty AR-15? Like, how does that happen? Like, uh, for the you, most part, I mean, if you want to transfer a weapon, you go buy one legally and then sell it to the next dude, and there's no record. He sold to the next dude, there's no record, or you bust into a house. I mean, a lot of these guys. We're just doing burglaries and then coming out with pieces and then they inscribe five deuce or whatever on it and, and they have this little cache of weapons in somebody's hole and that's it. So 
There's a lot of different ways it can come up with that. It's no different than, I, I think, than a handgun, especially these days. So, like, they say <clears throat> in Chicago, someone would come with a, a truck, would just randomly be there, and then everybody would break in the truck, and they would say, the government put that there. What would you say to that? Uh, well, there are a lot of people that think they're getting listened to and everything else. My stuff... You know, guys like, man, we can't use phones because, you know, they're listening. And I'm thinking, fool, I'm buying four ounces of, they ain't listening to you. But, you know, <laughs> I, I think there's a level that is possible. I mean, there, look, every police department has, has a, uh, you know, a, an anti-theft unit or whatever that'll sell out. They'll set some little, you know, 97 Chevy pickup with two lawnmowers in it and just watch it. Uh, with, you know, you know car. those things happen. So, yeah. Yeah, the bait cars are, are typical. Somebody's going to take advantage of the opportunity, and then you catch a thief, whether it's an opportunist or otherwise. You're not going to catch me taking a car ever. The worst thing I would ever do is realize it's unlocked and lock it for them or call the police and let them know there's an unlocked car. But if you're a thief, then, again, that's how Good you Samaritan. get caught, man. It's part of the game. Good that's Samaritan. what you're going to do. Good Samaritan. So you, you were going by, you know, T, T-E-E. Yeah. Um, which, I don't know, is that the name you wanted to tease? It's not very inventive, is it? Yeah. I mean, I, Somebody gave like, you that. Right. You, you, you don't want to come like Bulldog or, or no. Money Man or... or so, yeah, my my uh, second <laughs> operation following Fishbowl, I was rock star. But I was doing with the Mexican Mafia, and I got a little more say in that. But I figured part of my whole approach to this was that I'm going to be as much me as I possibly can, because the, the more little stories I try to make up or then I, the more crap I have to remember, then the worse it's going to be. So T and my name being Tegan just made sense. So and hence T cast and everything else. I mean, it's all part yeah, of exactly. something that kind of grew from that. But and people called me T anyway, but um, I thought it'd be easy. It's close to home. It's part of my personality. And basically everything I did, if I showed up and you know, bring some drinks and share Madden and talk crap about uh, who the Cowboys are drafting or whatever. All that human stuff was me. Yeah. And I didn't have to, like, try to make up some kind of weird thing and put on a wig and be all weird. So you were married at the time. Yes. Did, did your wife go by an alias whenever you talked to her? Or did, or like, if anyone asked, you got a girl and, yeah, I got a little broad, you know, yeah. whatever. Did you change her name and... No, well, I didn't change her name because, again, that especially, that's none of your business. <laughs> <laughs> right, We get you know? too deep. We so, get too deep. Again, it is kind of like that. Yeah, I got a girl, whatever, but, I, you know, I only talk as much as I need to talk. And people start making it into an inquisition. Then, and then I think, as any drug dealer would, they'd be like, eh, that's a little too, too personal. But, you know, it's like going into places where people lay their heads and trying to do business. It's just some rules of the game that you adhere by, and I played by those same rules. So, uh, and we didn't talk very often. It was really stressful for her. She yeah, knew, she yeah, so she knew I was at work and she could not call. So I would try to call whenever I had breaks and could and do stuff like that, but it was, I, I can't even imagine the stress. She sat up, she had a real job. She had to go to work at eight in the morning and she would, if I got a call, it's like midnight, man, hey, mom, way back from Waco, I got a something, something, you wanna meet me? I just get up out of bed and go meet these fools, and she would get up out of bed and go sit in the living room and watch TV and wait for me until four in the morning. And then she'd go to sleep. It was she was an amazing support system, but it also uh, that was rough for me too, knowing that I was wanting her to go to sleep, but you know she's hanging in there with me. Now I'm just curious if you weren't married. Were they like some ladies in the fishbowl that they were trying to throw at you like, hey, <laughs> team, I, hey, come over here and meet my guy T over here. Did that, did that ever happen at all? <laughs> no, not as much as just uh, some of the ladies try to get into some of the business. But there was plenty of prostitution and other things. I didn't get in so deep that people were wanting to share and do all kind of weird stuff. I, never, yeah, it never really kind of worked. I mean, there were boppers out there that would just kind of be around sometimes or whatever. But... Again, Boppers. when you're doing business, I was doing business. That's a passe term, yeah, I'm yeah. sure. I'm sorry. I mean, no, 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 no. I mean, no. This is, you, it's nostalgic for us. Okay. 
five. That is oh five. Yeah. yeah, I told you. I told you. Yeah, it starts now. Yeah, it it's, starts. it's been a minute. I'm I'm old, so. Uh, and so and but as as you know, when when you're over there and you're doing your thing, they're just kind of hanging out too. Um, what a fantastic source of information they they are. Right. They're, I'm they're, seeing and listening. But they're not doing business, you know, so much. So, yeah, didn't yeah, really, well. didn't really get any of that. No offers for action. Now, was it hard not to actually start looking at these some of these dudes as friends? Oh, well, I absolutely did. Oh. I absolutely did. Um, and and like I said, that's w- once you're in, you're in. I mean, I'd started by the time I've been doing this for over a year, and mm-hmm. and then it's like it's impossible to get out. Right. Uh, there are a few people that uh, are will remain unnamed forever, probably that should have had a case that for one reason or another, I was able to not put a case on them. Uh, but that was, it was, that's a very difficult thing to do. Right. Uh, so, and especially when you try to figure out how to do it without telling them who you are. I mean, you can't just come clean and say, hey fool, that's what I wanted to do. It's like, you know, you're the guy, but that's what, again, that's what I was gonna leverage my testimony for. Right. You know, I did do that for a few people that got slap on the wrist sentences and uh which i'm sure everybody else was probably like kicking themselves but i don't blame them either i just i thought for sure they would want to cooperate when they realized how much was at stake i mean if i'm looking at 30 years i mean it's it's pretty incredible that some of them wouldn't talk i mean and others really talked for a whole lot less time too so I mean, there's never know did, did they ever try to make you a crip like did they ever try to put you on no. the set okay no again i, I acted like a a real dumb fool when it came to gang stuff. They <laughs> probably were not interested in recruiting right. me, you know, showing up in a Steve, Steve Young jersey and stuff. And, and you know. I was a cowboy fan too, so that hurt. Right. <laughs> and now, how hard was it when you got home to take that suit off and not be T and just be Tegan or, you know what I'm saying, not use those same terms or colloquialisms that came yep. with being in that, in that um, environment? It's a great question for my wife, probably, but I I felt like I was handling okay. The level of stress was insane because I was literally the only undercover and I was the only one building the case. And even when the feds picked it up, I got resources and stuff, but I was still the only undercover. And so it was just a, a daily thing. There was a pivotal time where she had to call me to the carpet and say, look, you know, you're you're not the husband, that the person that I married and you're starting to act this, you're forgetful, you're this. So, and that was, I mean, she's the most important thing in my life. So at that point, that was a a reset for me to just get to the point where I had to really check myself, start thinking about, I don't think I, I I probably did slang. Did I slang you any? Was I coming home and kind of whatever? And I didn't like put on a total show, but I mean, you know, you start using different terms and stuff, but, that was a that was a check checkmate Bobbers. time of life. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. When you tell somebody, I think the first time I said I'm gonna be gone for a minute, she was like, okay. Like, no, no, no. I mean like a minute. I'll be gone for a minute. Like, 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 they, like, they sometimes show not uh, sixty seconds. Near. You know, not not to get all personal, but they sometimes show in the movies when someone goes deep on the cover, you know, and they're like living this. They they live one life and they and the, the lines start blurring. Yeah. Even the the intimacy might be a little like, hey, I'm. I'm T, you know, like, listen. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, we won't get, we won't get yeah. all that. <laughs> we won't get all that. <laughs> I, I have to ask, um, gangs, you were going at this, not for drugs, but to bust a gang. Right. Uh, the gang culture that was there, um, based on the violence. What were your thoughts on gang members prior to even saying, I want to bring this down? Like, what were your thoughts on someone saying, I'm, gonna, I'm a crip or I'm a blood? That's a young kid in the neighborhood saying that. Um, well, the ones that I was familiar with were making asses of themselves. So they were actually really disruptive. Um, and there was a lot of that too, saying, hey, you know, we support our crew. We're taking care of people. We're taking care of the neighborhood. And at the same time, they're gonna go drive by and shoot up houses and stuff and act like that's responsible. Um, or, you know, prostitutes and drug deals going down which again, if you have that going down in front of your house, you don't consider your house a safe place. So um, I think the perception and and like you said, as you said, the culture, a lot of that is part of the problem. You know, um, 
I, again, that's only a step in the process. You have to arrest people that commit violent crimes. You have to arrest them. But there has to be steps that follow in order to make sure that's not a cycle that continues over and over and over and over, or else it's just a, a legal war we're in, you know? Did I answer your question? I'm not sure what you, if that was what you were asking me. Did, was there anybody that you put away that got very personal for you? Like, oh, yeah, I'm going to make sure that he goes away. <laughs> like, you know, like, because just being in there, because you, you said you made, like, friends, but, yeah. like, enemies. Did you yeah. find anybody that's like, hey, he just, he's just a bad person. There was, there was a number of those, too, a great number of those uh, yeah. that were really, really bad to be out. Um, and look, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest. Um, I would have said, Hey, if you let me make the sentences, I would have put some people at the top all the way away. Some people in the middle, I would have given all these guys breaks. Cause I felt like I knew everybody. Of course, I'm many steps away from the judge that makes those decisions. And I learned that the hard way, but I've also discovered that there's some of these guys that I thought really had no chance that so far have come out and and been men and part of it might just be maturity you know you get out and you're a certain age you've been you know playing that game when you were 26 but now you're 48 and it's time to grow up and take care of your business or whatever um and there's other guys you know that i feel like i'm i mean i, I uh, i've got another meeting with uh, a judge you know coming up next week where i'm trying to get you know some of these fools out that i don't think deserve to be in as long as they are. So I'm actually backtracking and trying to salvage some of those cases that ended up being really long sentences that I viewed as unfair, which again, I have no control over until now, which is all I can do as, as a civilian essentially, but having connections to people that can help me learn about creative ways that we can maybe get these people out. Charleston said, uh, if you have a um, young man who is considering being a gang member, to put him in jail in his late teens to maybe his mid thirties. That way when he gets out, he'll know that he'll be a responsible man and he'll know exactly what he wants to do with his life because he ain't had nothing but time to think about it. And all the gangster stuff that he thought he wanted to be is the direct opposite of that in jail. What do you, what do you think about that of my state? It would be awesome if that was true and it would be scary if that was true. Um, I haven't done time, but I have, uh, obviously witnessed people that have done time and come out on the bad end and come out on the good end. And part of my plight, even in the podcast is to try to figure out what is the combination of culture, friendships, emotional value, parenting. What is the, what is the combination of, of circumstances that gives a person the conscious that leans them to the right side? And I don't know what that is. I, right. I mean, I can't say if that's, I can't say that's wrong. I would, my best hypothesis is that if you took 10 people and did that, you'd get five experienced criminals come out and you get five people that went the right way and tried to figure out life, but they'd be starting late. I mean, you're, you know, starting at 35 without really having to know how to navigate a bank account. So you're starting all over. But I think, I think it would split, you know, it's not, it's not rehab. You know, there are some really great programs nowadays in certain prisons or opportunities, but they're very difficult to get if you have a short sentence. You're going to be 10 years. A lot of those programs you don't have access to. Right. Do you, do you feel uh, prison is rehabilitating? Um, well, I say there are aspects that are, depending on who you are and what your aspirations are. Um, I know there are some phenomenal programs, but they are they're contingent on how long you're going to be in there. That's and true. if you're, you know, if you're a lifer and you want to take a leadership program, sometimes it's a little more difficult or a five year sentence. It might be more difficult. If you're going That's to do true. a 12 year sentence, you have opportunities and, you know, and you're a younger person, they, they know you're going to have opportunities to leverage some of these things uh, and you behave properly in there. I mean, there's a lot of circumstances that surround That's that stuff. True. And I have really good friends who teach in prisons. And so I know there are, well-intended people trying to teach. It's just, I don't know how widespread that, that really accounts for. Understandable. Um, now you started this, um, you know, local police department uh, and you're building a case and you know, the FBI gets involved. 
What yep. changes when the FBI gets involved? Does resources change? Does money like I know you only had so much money to play with to buy and do stuff as local yeah. police, but I was I was gonna burn I was gonna burn myself out on the, <laughs> right, on the cool. PD money is nothing, man. We're running and through that, it, man. I was running through it, and you know you, you got a boss covering for you, but that's only gonna last so long. Because even buying samples and going out every day of the week, you, you know I'm just I'm burning through a thousand bucks a week, and just buying little here's and there's and I'll be back and all that kind of, that only lasts for so long. Eventually they're like, dude, yeah, you're the, you know, where's the baby? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, and that's the, how I ended up getting picked up is that I actually shopped feds and I took what I had to a couple different agencies, ATF and DEA and FBI and DEA was of course like, Hey man, yeah, just give me the list of people and we got undercovers you can go to. I'm like, man, you can't just send a new dude down here and pick this up. And, uh, ATF, didn't have the resources or the or the time and the fbi at the time had a violent crimes task force that they had actually an agent assigned to in the area and assigned to the gang unit so they transferred me over to the gang unit and put me up in an office at the u.s attorney's office and assigned me a fbi agent to work for uh and and she actually at the time was still working on a case so the first three months i was assigned to the fbi She's busy on other stuff, but helping me facilitate getting resources. Wow. So I, I had a Range Rover and a Mercedes, and I was finally buying keys and moving stuff to where I'm finally backing up what I was talking about before. So it was very helpful. I had the gadgetry back in that day. I mean, I had Range Rover equipped with video surveillance and all stuff all in it. Yeah. Crap never worked, <laughs> ever. So, <laughs> I mean, I just got approached by a TV show like, hey, you know, we want to put you in and we're going to put you on this TV show about undercover and everything and get all your footage. And like, man, I ain't got no footage. <laughs> right, right. I mean, it's a cool story, exist. but man, you got to act exist. this out. And yeah. You know, so so, that's so I'm curious, um, this 18 months, how with the FBI getting involved, how much time frame till like, we're going to wrap, like this case is going to be solidified and closed out, or at least we're going to start making some arrests. How much, how much time were they involved with the FBI? Oh, uh, they were involved about a full year because I was wow. about eight months in when I started shopping. Because eight months is pushing it, as you know, when I'm kind of trying to go guy to guy and you know sample this and spend a, you know, if I got to save up and buy an ounce, then cool, I'm at least doing something, you know. But um, yeah, so I worked with them for a year. The U.S. Attorney is the one that finally drew the line too and said, "Hey, we've got this many cases. We got 51 cases." The feds actually took 41 of them and the other ones the state took, but they drew a line and said, hey, we're gonna give you X amount of time. And I remember asking for an extra week because it was an event happening. And I really, really was desperate to get a case. At the time, I didn't have my kingpin pinned down yet. I had information, but again, dude's smart and I'm not just like hanging around playing mad with him yet. Right, this is somebody Trying to work that my way in. Was in the Texas or somebody yeah, outside yeah, of Texas? Yeah, my Texas, my, my, my kingpin. And, oh, yeah, in the, in the case. City, yeah. Uh, so uh, so was, that's, that's what I ended up doing is just going all out to try to create a case there on that. And it was wrapped up. Was there a bigger fish like cartel, anything that you felt like you yeah, were like, absolutely. we could really kind of go through this thing? Yeah, and I was in the house with him too. I mean, I, I, knew, who he, I knew what he looked like and wasn't sure, if, you know, it wasn't his car. You know, I just, it was like a street name, you know. That's all I've got to go on. Uh, and it's not like I hung out with them all the time. I was just working my way to the point where I could actually be in the room when some of this stuff is happening. Never got that. I just had the line drawn. And, you know, I honestly, I probably would have just kept going until my wife finally drew the line or the U.S. attorney drew the line anyway, because it was just, it, it became obsessive you yeah. know, at that point. Because, you know, everybody's connected. Once you start getting to know people, they're, introducing you to other connections, man. I don't even need informants because bad guys are introducing me to bad guys and saying, man, he's good. And, and I was just, I was blowing up, you know, people were coming to me. So I, I needed to stop too. Yeah. Do you believe you could get in too deep? Like when you, now that you've like, most people can't say they went undercover at this, to this extent. Right. Do you believe like, yeah, you could get lost in this thing and like going in, like still be goal oriented as far as to make arrests, but Years in, like man, I'm years yeah, into this thing. I think for sure. I mean, I had, uh, I had a wife at home and a kid, so that was kind of my my checkpoint to where I wouldn't get lost because that was still a top priority in my life there. But man, if I was a single guy doing, which honestly, that's the type of people that usually do this work. 
uh, for any length of time. If I was just alone and wasn't risking anyone else's life by doing what I was doing and knew that it was for the right reasons, I mean, yeah, for sure you can get lost. But again, the U.S. Attorney stopped me anyway. So, so you know. what are your thoughts when you look at something like Snowfall and you see uh, police or a guy who works for the government who is used for the government to funnel drugs into the black community. Like, this is a true story. Uh, we have Free Ray Ricky Ross on this couch as well, where he said, yes, no, there were CIA informants that used me and black people to get drugs into it, to allow this, to, to kind of feed guns into Columbia. It's, it's this whole narc war and thing like that. Yeah. But what do you feel about that when CIA agents are using the lower end communities to just fuel drugs into the community? I mean, I think there's, I think there's a line and there, there are lines that you can cross and can't cross, but I think a lot of the lines get really gray uh, when it comes to legal issues and who's actually touched it, who's doing what. Um, I'll be the first to say that, you know, I think uh, the black communities have been a pawn since the 80s, for sure. Uh, so I can see why that being leveraged on top of the history of crack and the punishment le leveraged for crack and the fact that they made it out to be so much worse than anything else that the world could have and crack babies and all these fallacies that were made up. Um, I can absolutely see why as part of the systemic issue that again is born of our past that we don't recognize as ignorance, where that could be really problematic. But I seriously doubt there was much consideration for how this is going to impact a culture or a particular person or whatever. I, I don't know. I can't speak for that, but uh, and I don't know enough about that case either to, to speak uh, with a lot of, of depth. But if, uh, if that's what was being leveraged, then I think it would be important to know what role is being played and what's going to happen to the people that are playing those roles. You know, if all those people are going to get locked up forever as part of a giant conspiracy that they facilitated, that's, that's pretty difficult to swallow. In an interview, you said that you, they asked you, do you feel that we should be illegal? And you said yes. Yeah, I did. Do you still feel that way? I don't feel that way anymore, actually. Uh, and that was a while ago. Here's, here, was, here was my impression, and this is based on the experience that I've had with the people that I was around that smoked weed, is that most of the people that I was around that were regular weed smokers were complacent. Um, and you're looking at the, the world blowing up and passing us by and coming up with all this technology and everything else, and we're looking at trying to go to four-day work weeks and shorten school years and legalize weed. I'm thinking, <laughs> we're just counting the years here. So, so we're behind the, behind the dime. That's just a, a, a born of a lack of appreciation for how it could be leveraged properly. I was also scared about you know, open carry and all that stuff. You just, you kind of don't know till you dip your toes in the water how it's gonna go. So actually, I, I don't feel that anymore. But that was the reason at the time why I had that opinion, because it was just from personal experience is all. When it all, uh, when it all comes down and you get start, everybody is dealing with, you know, looking at time, what is the percentage of individuals who are going to cooperate? Hmm. I could probably get you a number, but I'm going to guess right now because I'd have to go back and research. It's been an, a bit of time. Um, like I said, we sold, solved nine cold case murders for a reason, because they start saying, hey man, you know, JoJo's got, you know, six keys in the kitchen. We're like, mm, not worried about keys. We got this, you're looking at 30 years, how about something else? And they're like, well, I know, you know, Gator murdered that dude over at the stop and shop. Okay, now we're talking, right? Um, and I, you know, I don't, I don't even look at anybody any differently one way or the other. I, I know how frustrating it can be and I know snitching is a is a big issue, especially coming off of uh, uh, Charleston stuff. Yeah. Uh, but I'm I'm amazed that somebody would take a case that was born from somebody making them do something, almost like the CIA situation. You know, man, I'm just a middleman, and you're letting me go down. Not only let me go down, you're letting me feign a bunch of heat. I mean, these dudes at the top aren't saying, "Hey, man, so and so's just." You know, he just smokes weed and he kind of introduces people every once in a while, but he's a nut. Nobody, nobody does that. Right. So, um, I mean, we probably had 
close to, we had more than half, I would say, try to give you some. Now, most people, as you know, aren't going to give you, uh, you know, a book of information right off the bat. Right. So a lot of it is, if I'm in the room, I know what you're giving me. I know some of it's true, and I also know some of it's bullshit. So I call that. I'm like, hey, you know, look, we, we need real information, and we need stuff that's not just a dope deal or whatever. And that's that's where they start validating the information that they're giving. And again, to me, that is validating the whole purpose of not only what I was doing, but the fact that they're cooperating. If you're going to give me somebody that's out in your neighborhood that's willing to murder people in your own neighborhood, why wouldn't you want to get them the hell out of your neighborhood? I, don't, I, I do understand that you don't want to give them up and then have to go back into that neighborhood and under threat. I understand that, and that's a, a huge concern. But just for the sake of of not snitching, I, I don't get when it comes to violence like that, because nobody should want that. I was going to ask also, with that being said, do you really believe that there is a war on crime? I mean, a war on drugs. That's a, that's a really complicated question, because on every level it's different. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, my view of the war on drugs in general is, yes, politics are absolutely involved. Do I think it's a a conscious conspiracy where all these people meet in a room and come up with these plans to try to keep money flowing in and this and that. No, but politics work differently. And uh, if you're manipulated through politics, you're still doing the wrong thing in a lot of cases. Uh, and I think basically the way the approach is on, on drugs in America these days, I think it's a giant wheel spin. It's necessary to combat it, but you know, at a, at a local level, there's one thing at a federal level, there's another and an international level, there's another, and there's not like one person like operating amongst all that thing to, to be able to see where all the conspiratorial stuff is happening. There, and the reason for my question is because we talk about gang violence and usually from, you know, what I've seen, gangs are always predicated around the drugs <clears throat> and that to, to, to get access to money. So yeah. if there are no drugs, there are no, there's no money to be gang. Well, we're just a bunch of dudes hanging around want to beat people up at this point. We should be easy to stop. Maybe. I mean, there's, <laughs> yeah, and there's still, I mean, there's other crime. You know, there's, right, of course. there's burglaries, there's robberies. There's, I mean, that kind of stuff is happening, too, in the gang culture. Right. Um, a lot more difficult to make that into a whole lot of money. But, um, yeah, I look, I'm, I'm all for changing the tactics for sure. Now, you said uh, you expected more people to rat, snitch, tattletale, cooperate. And you were upset that people weren't doing that. Mm -hmm. Like, you, do you understand as far as the way we look at that, as far as the black community, um, you know, snitches get stitches, you can't yeah. tell. Do you feel like that's, that, that code or that lingo or that phrase is old, like it should be more self-preservation, like you said, if I'm up here. I think it's turned into something that is so steadfast that you you can't have a conversation about um whether or not there are circumstances that that deserve to snitch or whatever and that's part of it too is you're using negative terminology to talk about somebody that's cooperating in order to take years off of a sentence that was born of somebody else's action um, that is also causing violence or somebody in your family was murdered and you're asking the community to help find out who killed your sister and nobody wants to help. At some point, that negative terminology is locking somebody into a mindset that is absolutely unrealistic uh, because it's not just the black community either. I mean, there's all kinds of communities that don't want to snitch, you know, because again, as long as you make it a negative term, that's called it snitching, then it's obviously you're some kind of rat, you know, whatever. And that's, the people that created those negative terms are the gangsters at the highest level. You know, those are the, those are the, uh, the mobs and the everything exactly. else. Turn those all into little uh, derogatory yeah. terms for those people that would cooperate. And it was like, yeah. I call it It's only to protect them. Like, this is to protect me. Yes. So, yeah, exactly. that's exactly how it works. But the other people are the ones that are suffering because of you. And so why would you expect them to do anything less? So uh, I, I do understand in principle that if I live in a, in a small community 
and I'm going to give up information and then have to go back to bed and they're not going to arrest this person and take them away forever, that I'm going to have hell to pay. And that I understand. So that's the one instance where I have an understanding of that. And I used to, uh, I used to um, actually protect people that had information and say, look, if you tell me so-and-so is, is the one that's muling all this stuff in, tell me how they're doing it and I'll figure out another way to discover it on my own, but I'm not gonna out you. I mean, I think that's something that law enforcement should address too, because I think law enforcement handles informants terribly. I mean, there's, there's very little consideration for their safety. They just want the information, hit the case, and everything else, which also just makes it harder to get information. Right, like if you don't care about my safety, it's, come on, they what are we doing? They usually don't. Yeah, so, it's a shame. Uh, you're an author of a book called Life in the Fishbowl. Let's bring yes, that book in. Yeah. Um, yeah, there you go. And uh, we, we, have, we can see it, so you can kind of set it right there next to, um, uh, kind of set it up on the, yeah, yeah. there you go. Um, so you're an author of this book, um, and I'm just curious, um, you know, when you got through what you got through, you know, I think 08 is when the, uh, trial started and the rest started to happen. Yeah. The, by the end, uh, well, by the, by the end of 07, beginning of 08, they okay. came to a close. Came to a close. Um, even as far as, uh, right before, you know, we're going to talk about the life in a fishbowl. I want to talk about that closure real quick as far as, um, what was it for you to get this case closed and done. Like as far as, hey, where the, the FBI said, hey, we're, we're getting this thing done. Yeah. This is the day. What was that that day like as far as the arrest going out to everyone you know that was gonna be indicted? The arrest process was like the stock exchange floor, man. It was, it was uh, old school phones lining a long conference room with a bunch of feds at each one, maps and mug shots and locations and stuff listed all over the floor. And this is the first time I've done, you know, a, a warrant like this where I'm not geared up and hitting places, you know, we're, they're trying to arrest 50 plus people at right. the same time. Right. So as soon as they say green light and all these people are moving, all of a sudden these phones are ringing and people are coming up with information. They said they got so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, but they, they have information at so-and-so they're sending people every which way. And I'm just like, this is bizarre. It was a crazy experience for me. I'm sure other feds in these giant cases have seen that stuff before, but especially with the old school phones and everything, it right. was it was just <laughs> right. very very uh, primitive, but but really exciting. But uh, at the conclusion of this, I was um, I don't know how you describe that emotion. I was empty and uh, I was exhausted. I think is what it, I was emotionally exhausted because I had been going at it for the better part of two years and. Um, you know, had all this, all these people to think about, uh, the, the, the long-term goal of salvaging the neighborhood was a success. I even went back in and interviewed some people after they had, they sold off all the houses, tore down all the ones that were dilapidated and put up fences and flower beds in different places. And, you know, you could see kids. I mean, that was really the purpose. Uh, but it was just, it was the strangest feeling ever because it was just, I, I didn't know I didn't expect it to go forever, but it felt like it was going to go forever. And just emotionally, I was completely flattened. And everyone um, is attempted to get at one time. They're going to try to grab everyone. Did anyone go on a run? Like, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How many people like just like, oh, shit, it's coming down. And oh, how a bunch. Many, how many, a bunch. OK. Yeah. I think we got the first day of the roundup. We got 26, I think. Oh, yeah, so I think that's really about right. Like yeah. And within that week, you know, everybody knows everybody. So, again, you're we, we had. You know, we lined up 200 plus, 220 some law enforcement officers in a gymnasium to plan for this. So yet agencies from all over the place participating in the roundup and stuff. And so they continue to go try to find these fools. Is there anything that you regret from all this? I think I'm already taking care of that because really the regret was finding out that this wasn't the end game because in my, in my opinion, the reason why I did this was to salvage the neighborhood and I did that, but ultimately these people are either, are, are gonna have kids that were left behind that are now gonna grow up and become the new citizens of this community, right. having been fatherless for their entire upbringing. And so my plight now in life is to take care of the other end of that. 
and mentor kids of incarcerated parents and teach them that there are better opportunities so that somebody doesn't have to be me in 18 years and do this again and do this again. Because again, that's, that's only a piece of the puzzle. You got to rescue the women from the abusers and then you got to get them help. Help them. That is you know? true. You can't just so, do the deed. So that's, a, that's what I'm doing. And, and look, I, I, I have my hands in the, in the pie in terms of prison uh, uh, programs and stuff too. But my primary focus is on kids that are coming up in those communities that end up fatherless and just having some kind of a mentorship program and showing them things that they'd never fathomed before. Because again, you know, you grew up in a poor community, your ceiling is this high in your eyes. When it's really this high, but you know, everybody before you and around you are doing these other things and here's your choice or here's your choice. And there's really more to it than that. So it's just a matter of, of trying to take care of it that way. And that's in any poor community, by the way. It's not just the black communities either. Um, you know, I think it, for the most part, that's where you find gangs and drugs is in uh, socioeconomically deprived communities. So that's really where the that's really where the issue lies. So um, what whatever happened to like the women that they left behind? Did they ever reach out to you? I've had a few reach out to me. Yes, uh, not always on the greatest of circumstances. Some of them, uh, my wife and I would go drop off Christmas presents or something because they're taking care of a bunch of kids now. Um, others are calling me about court cases that their kids are having to deal with that I'm trying to contribute to help them out as much as I can do, do what I can, when I can. Um, and then other others that I know of, I think have just moved on. But again, I, I don't, I only keep so many tabs out there and I'm not again, trying to poke the bear. So I wish them well, as much as I wish the guys that got in prison and get, get out, I wish them well too. I mean, look, this is what you did. Here's the time. My wish is that you get out and become successful because I mean, that's it. I mean, that's, that's how the game is played. You did your time. So now I, I, I wish the best for you. There you go. And now we have uh, the book Life in the Fishbowl uh, written and uh, authored by uh, Tegan Broadwater. Um, the, first, let's talk about the book itself. Um, uh, you wrote this book uh, to more so not talk about the story of what happened, I know it's in there, but also just to be able to, the aftermath of what that was. Right. Um, the families, uh, you know, like I think it was mentioned, like 140 families were broken up to this, um, to where this book is written. Uh, first and foremost, the proceeds of the book are right now to help those families that were affected by this. Yeah. Um, what was your purpose of writing the book? Can you tell us a little <clears throat> bit about the book? Maybe, because um, this is a revised version of right. the first one. Uh, I mm -hmm. think you wrote the first one when? Uh, 2013. 2013, I think, yeah. and this is the 2020 version of right. uh, Life in the Fishbowl. There's additional chapters and different things in there. I, I wasn't planning on writing a book at all. Um, and what I used to do is, you know, if I was surveilling or had somebody's name that came to mind or that I need to investigate or whatever, I'd scribble it down on a napkin or write down something significant and then wad it up like a snot rag and, you know, throw it in the, in the side of my vehicle or whatever. Um, and so I had some stories that I thought were worth telling, but the people that were encouraging me to write a book, I, I couldn't come up with a real true reason because it seemed, um, you know, it seemed kind of like a, a self-promotion thing otherwise. So as the thing got to the end and we, and we, some, I had a conversation with somebody that talked about what are what does the family situation look like now that these people are gone and we counted 104 kids now that didn't have a father that changed the deal there you go so, so that's that's why that's the motivation the single motivation behind writing the book and 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 why we donate all the profits to the book i mean i don't know if i've got reviews of people that are like hey this is another guy coming in trying to take down a black community but they haven't read the book because yeah, you have to read uh, again if, if you bought it and you're disappointed at least you put it towards a good cause, which is Hope Farm. They mentor children of incarcerated parents starting at the age of five. They've mentored kids through the program that have graduated, got college degrees, get a master's degree, and then come back and work at Hope Farm. I mean, that ain't a story, dude. It's, they're amazing. Is it hard to shoulder that you have individuals that think that you were just out to take down a black community? I've gotten better at it, um, especially since I've started you know, getting, putting myself back out in the public eye 
Uh, when it first came out, I got all kinds of criticism again. I got lots of praise and lots of criticism, lots of people coming out saying they were involved that I have no idea who they were. You know, it's people trying to claim I was a this or my cousin was this. I was like, oh, I don't know who that is, but hey, it's fine. You know, what? it's to each their own, right? Um, I've learned how to let that just roll off my back because I've, and that's taken time. I'm sure people like you guys understand this too, having the podcast out, you get haters, you get all kinds of comments that you just learn to ignore because this isn't a person trying to have a productive conversation or make a, an important point that could be contradictory which I'm cool with. Somebody could bring up something that makes me feel like, wow, I've been doing this all wrong. I welcome that because conversation is the whole point. Uh, and if you're just a hater, then I've just finally grown up to the point of you know, being out in the public and I'm not used to that. But after a little bit of time, you start putting yourself out there and learning how to discern who's really a, a part of the solution and who's a part of the problem. And you just learn how to ignore the part of the problem. And it is a giant shame because if I did take it personally, that would be one of the things that disturbed me the most. I know I'm a big white stiff, but I've got experience in different communities that most white stiffs don't have. And that's why I'm trying to share my experience. So I have to ask then, um, you mentioned some kids you've seen in the house, five, six, seven, running around with <coughs> guns and you know, scales laying on everywhere. And like this book, technically, you know, you wonder what happens to those kids right after like, this was probably their main source of income from, or their father, you know, whoever, you know, they're, you know, they're, there's yep. food in their belly. But then you have a situation like Hope Farm that could come in and provide resources mm -hmm. to those mothers and families. Do you check in as far as to see how those resources are being used in the fishbowl as of today? Uh, in, in terms of checking in with Hope Farm and just leveraging Hope Farm, that, but just kind I of seeing do. a landscape, maybe even driving, just driving yeah. your car through and just seeing how things are looking. I um, do. Okay. okay. I, I, yeah, I, I have lots of people who say, hey man, yeah, take me through. I want to see, you know, where you were at and all this kind of stuff. There are some, there's some folks that have come right back to the corner. Um, it's not the way it was right after the thing hit and the houses were rebuilt and everything, but it's still a lot better than it was. I mean, it's not a place that people have to really sweat pulling down in. Hence the reason why I've driven down there before. And I'll see a couple of guys at the corner be like, oh man, I, I know who that, exactly who that fool is. And he just got out and he's back at the corner. I don't know if he's selling or not. And I'm not worried about it. I was just, uh, but I, it does interest me to see that, you know, I don't know if it's a validation or what. I know there's a perfectly good chance that it could digress back to where it was. But again, if we work hard at focusing on the community as a whole with the younger generation, I think that we're not going to see that. We're going to see a reversal over time. Do you think gentrification could stop what's going on in the fishbowl? Uh, I, I don't think so, because uh, gentrification, in the way I interpret it, is not necessarily growing the community. It's bringing other people in to grow around the community, which essentially forces the community elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, I mean, there's got to be a different way to do it. That's through education and resources and so that they can grow their own community. And that's really the ticket. It seems kind of logical to me, but it's rare. Any tips you could give to any guys who are probably looking or undercover now, maybe watching this, um, any tips you could give them as far as what, you know, to go undercover, uh, to be successful at going undercover could heed them? Yeah. Uh, the main thing is to have a purpose. I think it's like any business deal or anything else. You have to be keyed in on why you're doing what you're doing so that you keep yourself on, on the track as you go. Cause there's going to be all kinds of extraordinary circumstances that happen and you're going to get frustrated and you're going to have misses and you're going to have dangerous circumstances. You're going to have wins, but it all has to remain focused on why you're doing what you're doing. That has to be the main thing. And any advice to a kingpin that's looking at this right now? He's balling out of control. He's having his way. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say to him right now? Man, this is going to sound obvious too, but it's, it's death or jail. And I know that's, that's a cliche, but you don't just work in that industry and stay free. It's just <laughs> not how it works. So uh, I even, you know, when I started uh, getting interested in doing uh, undercover work, 
I read a book on how to smuggle uh, into the U.S. You know, I was interested in all these different aspects of how you do it. And it, and it opened by saying, hey, if you're going to do this for 10 years, plan on spending five or six of them behind bars. I and mean, that's how the game is played. So, and I don't think people have that. I think they think, well, I got a better game than that. So I'm going to be different because I'm different. And I am better than that or whatever. Man, it just doesn't ever work out that way. You always end up getting locked up and lo being locked up is never good. And being dead is even worse. That's very true. Um, and those cats can't testify. Now, you know, you can't testify how bad it is if you're already underground. All you get are people in prison to testify. And maybe not, not, in, not in your situation, but have you ever seen a, a success, a situation where an individual came out, made a bunch of, made a bunch of money in a way, maybe had to go sit down for six, seven years, and he came out and he's like a millionaire in real estate or, or credit repair or something crazy like that? By like leveraging what he had before? Yes. Well, um, that may be happening. I, I venture to guess, you know who you are. If you got your money, good for you. But uh, he's smart enough to go create a living doing real estate on his own and getting a license and everything else. He had a real estate license before. So, uh, you know, that's, that's part of it. Look, if you, if you take it and go straight and you go move to the beach with red, that's all good, man. <laughs> yeah, you know? Definitely, definitely. That's crazy because I, I would assume if you're at that level of a kingpin, you could probably do some legit business the right way as well. You're yeah. also good at something. Right. It's just that transition it always catches up to you, man. I've been, I get calls to this day. I mean, I've been out of this game for 15 years. I still get calls, man. Hey man, so-and-so's got, you know, so-and-so in the kitchen and blah, blah. I just, I'm like, dude, <laughs> I got I to gotta really? tell the so I got to call people. So I got to call even the other day about this guy got arrested and they're trying to figure out what it is. And can you figure out who's, and I don't mind doing that, helping people out or whatever. But again, it was a guy that made a stupid mistake in November and he knew what it was, but didn't know what was in the package he was asked to deliver. He made 600 quick bucks. It's the only time he did it. And now they picked him up. So, so okay. stuff like that, just even the little stuff just comes to haunt you, man. You can't just leave. So that, that I was going to just going to ask that question. So there's never to do. It's never like I got one more th thing and I'm out the game. Yeah, I mean, look, if you can gamble like that, I'm sure there are people out there that said, hey, man, this is house money. I do this deal and they do the deal and it works and they leave. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it could never happen. Right. But most people don't leave because you get the taste. Right. I mean, it's why Vegas is built. <laughs> so there's been a recent report that uh, Colombian cocaine is back and it's what was really used to cook crack um, back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. that there, that's making a return. Um, of course. Do you have an itch or do you have any solace as far as getting back, not saying in the game, but if someone in law enforcement reached out to you saying, hey, we need your assistance. A consult or something. Yeah, consultant to go sure, back yeah. undercover to try to. Uh, going you know, back undercover, I don't know if it'd work. Again, I put myself out there now and with media, social media and media and record keeping the way it is. I mean, you'd find out so much more now in an instant that you than you did 15 right. years What's ago yeah so i mean you're gonna find a picture i mean you found an interview where i was talking about weed i mean that's how long ago is that right. and right. and i can't escape that because you're gonna say wait a minute that's that fool you know it's <laughs> i can't get away with that anymore um i am connected with you know pablo escobar's kid and uh the Cali cartel william rodriguez is out and he's in miami I've, I've had both of them on my cast too those two are now friends and trying to make amends with the people whom their fathers are responsible for murdering. And in Pablo's case, he's got like, you know, 5,000 people he's trying to reach out to. Um, and that's, uh, that's a basis that I think is significant. If it was to, to return somewhere to Colombia, he still has established himself as a legit businessman, has nothing but love in his heart and is all about redemption. And if that guy's not a lesson for gang members that just want revenge, because you know, so-and-so killed my cousin and whatever. I mean, look at these two fools and you just have to shut your mouth and say, look, it's possible to put it all down and make up. But mm -hmm. no, I couldn't go back undercover, man. How I'm, easy, I'm an old man. How, <laughs> she's saying no. <laughs> if I wanted to, she's saying, no, nah, nah, you can't. She, I need one. permission. I got permission the first time. I did actually, but she would say no this time and I would concede. Uh, how easy do you think your job would have been in the social media era? 
Um, look, it would be a completely different game yeah. right now. Uh, but I was also the type of person that for the longest time, even with social media, I was just never out there. I'd start an account on Facebook or something and just get they like feel weird about it and just shut it down. So I don't really, didn't really have a presence until I started. No, I'm not even talking up. about for you, like for like, because the, the, the allure of flashing money and cars and firearms is very prevalent <clears throat> with people oh. who work in it. Oh, it makes it a lot easier to catch folks like that too. Um, and I, and you see it happen all the time. Um, that's just ignorance, but I mean, those fools, they're just asking to be locked up. If you're really a kingpin, then you're not on social media flashing a handful of twenties and showing your new this and that. That's just, that should tell you everything you need to know. Cause if you're really a smart guy and you're really running an empire, nah, you're not putting yourself out there like that. Those people are all fronting. Definitely. Now, um, not only, uh, life in a fishbowl, um, uh, let's definitely tell them, you know, other things that you're part of again, you know, heavy into music, uh, musician, first and foremost, you know, was the first passion. Uh, yeah. but now of course, podcasting, mm -hmm. um, and having, uh, you know, being a CEO of your own company and, you know, production and things like that. Uh, tell us about things that you have now, as far as, you know, outside of being an author, uh, well, of yeah. things you got going. Thanks for that. I, I, when I left the police department, I started a, uh, an armed security investigations and protection company. And I've had that now for 15 years plus, And Congrats. And have recently um, started a, and it's in, it's in its infancy because it is a creative media company, but uh, I've got consultants and celebrities uh, attached to the project. Uncommon Souls is ultimately the, the banner for which we're working. It, it's not retelling the fishbowl story, but it's taking the concept of the fishbowl and showing how much, especially with the extremism that we have, whether it be the music that I'm doing or how-to books or the podcasts or any of that stuff that we're doing right now, it's all tied into bringing people who might still be in disagreement, but want to be at the table and have that conversation to, to garner empathy and understanding of other people that are different. And I think there's a lot more of us than get credit because it's not exciting to see somebody say something and then get talked out of it on the news. Uh, it's more exciting to see somebody, you know, waving a banner and, and being crazy. So the purpose is again, to, to gather people that are, that are fans of different uh, media, whether it be podcasts or music or books, video games, things like that, and bring them into a community called Uncommon Souls, where we can commune with people that are of different cultures, learn about one another and create a community that's diverse. I love it, man. Cause I love just even being able to, again, mix cultures, mix understanding of one another. So therefore it can be taught to the next generation as far as having these conversations. Yeah. I'm glad that we're able to sit down and have a conversation like this. Cause I don't think this could have happened uh, 20 years ago and things like that. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm appreciative of being here too. But again, I, I learn as much from you as, as you do me. I don't get to ask as many questions, but I appreciate the learning process yeah. too. I know I have a unique experience, but I don't know everything. Yeah, we're going to come strong. on. Yeah, we're going to come on your platform and tell some tell some. Uh, I hope up, you yeah, do, man. Oh, we'll set that up. No, we'll set that up. Uh, has anyone shopped that around for a movie or a show or anything? Has Fifty Cent reached out or anything to? No, I'm waiting for Fifty Cent. Actually, <laughs> yeah, man, that hey, Fifty Fifty, you got a story here. Yeah, look into it. I'm telling you, man, this is crazy. Yeah. I think that would be a, a perfect a perfect one. I, I do. I did have. Uh, I have a writer in LA that's attached as a writer who owns the rights. Um, and he and I have uh, collaborated on some documentary footage and different things because we had a producer in LA, Scott Bernstein uh, had, was the first producer to attach to the project. He did straight out of Compton and it was right up his alley. We'd had lots of meetings, but then COVID hit. And so that contract essentially expired. And so I'm backtracking, going back, build up on Common Souls so that we get a little bit of traction behind the, the book and the story and the podcast, we have some attention. It's going to be easier to move forward with ultimately under the Uncommon Souls banner to do the TV series, which, you know, we started out writing a movie uh, with Scott and then even Scott had said, hey, this needs to be a TV show. And, and my vision again is, is this is not a Batman story. This isn't about how I'm a badass and took out all the bad guys. Um, and I would be mortified if I thought the movie or TV show would be written accordingly, which is why I'm attached to that writer because he understands the true purpose of the story 
the human aspect of the story and the success and tragedy that fit in the same. And I'd love to be able to tell a story that, that uh, equated to something like The Wire where you're kind of hoping the bad guy kind of gets away because you have an affinity for the person, you know, but you know, but you got to root for the good guys and, and you're kind of torn because that's essentially what this story is about. It's being torn and then making amends the, the most responsible way you can so that you know you're still doing right by people. Do you think you can get a 12 episode season for seven seasons out of what you've experienced in that 18 months? 12 episodes and seven seasons? Probably. Um, I think the, the, what I, when I was working with Scott, I think we had expanded to five seasons, five, 10 episode seasons. Mm -hmm. I look, there's 51 arrests in here. Mm -hmm. When you write a book, you can't talk about 51 people right? or else the reader's going to be all over the, like, who is this guy? So I really had to narrow it down to seven, eight people, which is really pushing your luck. Because, you know, in terms of a story structure and how it's supposed to work, I learned more about story structure. I sat with, with authors and, and professors to make sure I get the storytelling process down and actually author this well. Uh, you know, so um, I, I think that's going be, gonna to be key is that it's written properly. Would you be opposed to paying the individuals in your story for their intellectual property? For their character. Oh, uh, I mean, like however needs know, to work. XYZ identity, you know, this is him. And he's probably going to see this and want some money because he's going to be like, this is me. Oh, I mean, I guess if that happens everywhere, then, uh, then it'll happen. Um, I mean, uh, these things aren't made with my money. The book sure as hell was. But uh, so I know I'm... I'm I'm dumping money into the business, right? That's how business owners do. I know you know this. Right. Um, it's not like you just get rich first. First, you have to save up everything you got and you dump it all in. But if that's the way it needs to work, fine. I've had people, you know, call up the newspaper and complain because, you know, so-and-so story was, you know, a defamation and everything else. And they're like, well, this is a public record and you're a criminal and whatever is telling the story. I mean, and there's been books out about this from their perspective, which ultimately is what I'm looking to do. So uh, I do have relationships with some of the people that were involved. And my goal is to include as much of that. And look, giving back is what it's about. You got to make money to continue the process, but giving back, whether it be involving some of the parties that were actually imprisoned or some of their kids play a part or a, whatever somebody you know gets a you know gets a, a music bed portion in there where and I started when I started doing the music that's was the intention because when we started talking about a TV series I said well I'm gonna put my studio back together and do some stuff and I had some local rappers contribute to some of the stuff I'd write the music and sing the chorus and they and and they would come on and sing some rhymes I said well these are these are cats from the community that know all about the story and it would be perfect uh, synergy to just put people that are making music and trying to build a career from that same city who know the story and plug them into that, that role. So I'm, I'm all about making everybody win. If that's what you're asking, yeah. I don't know the logistics no. of paying off right. somebody for, Hey, that no, was me. So you have to get like, even Rick Ross said like snowfall. He's like, that's my life story. And he's like, I haven't seen a cent from it. Yeah. But, uh, so do you have dudes that come in your studio and rap and you about this lifestyle? And you're just like, you got to give them that look like, say, bro. Like. <laughs> uh, no, because uh, look, you know, I, I'm, I'm old too. So, uh, so I'm coming from a, an older time and I've got cats that are, I don't, I don't have gangster rappers coming in. Okay. Um, and honestly, it wasn't really a lot of gangster gangster rap was a different thing it almost was passe in the mid aughts when you're talking about 2005 it's not like people were doing anything remotely what they're doing now when gangster rap started you hit the 90s and you got that whole nwa thing that's trending up it sort of went away for a period of time to where everybody was listening to rap of different different styles and different things but it was less about you know you know you know flashing the gun and everything else so um these cats were actually rapping about circumstances and that's even the music i do on my own is about is 
telling stories that will elicit conversation about things that are, you know, I did one for the, the Pablo Escobar uh, series that we were talking about doing. It talks about, a, you know, as a Hispanic guy and his father and him doing dope and the consequences that. So I'm trying to tell the same types of stories. It's right. not telling this story again, but, and the same thing happened, you know, with the rap. We had a, a one that we got a bunch of kids into rehab because one guy was, was getting heroin pushed on him and, and he, he was a son of some of our friends. He ended up committing suicide oh, wow. as he got addicted. And so we shot a video with Lou Charles and did that and, you know, got a bunch of people into rehab. And again, we had some, I put in a ton of money and some other people put in some money to make the video and get it disseminated so that people knew where to get help, but it was telling a true story. And those are the types of things we're trying to do is just do impactful stories that people experience that can bring us together and say, hey man, I can relate to that. That's real. And I'm just curious, if you was to have a show, would you have or be upset if uh, Tommy Egan played you? Uh, Joseph Sikora from Power. From where? The, the, the show Power. Oh man, I, don't, I haven't seen it. No, hey, well, we'll send you a screenshot. Dang it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry about that. That's anticlimactic. <laughs> you got any shout outs? Man, uh, man, shout out to Charleston. Shout out to Kirk Simon Dinger. And shout out to all those cats out there that have gotten out, man. Like I said, I, I wish nothing but the best, man. I hope. I hope you turn your lives around and make successes. Hey Amen. And for anybody who wants to get in touch with your, with your program and your movement on social media, how would they do that? Uh, you can catch me on T at uncommonsouls.us. That's the easiest way. It's my email. Um, I have a YouTube channel that's Uncommon Souls. And my music is TCAD, T-E-E-C-A-D, which... Again, my undercover name, full name was T. Cadell. And so my music moniker is T. Cad. Hey, man, we would like to thank you so much for coming up here and sharing some of your experiences with us and telling your story. Yeah. Uh, we look forward to seeing you grow and where this journey takes you, man. We can't wait to see you on the show. Hopefully you have some cast and room for us. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. man, hey, man, this is the best part. Tegan Broadwater. You are a real life street star. Yay. Yeah. Honored to be here, man. Thank you all. Yeah.